What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Today we wrap up our series on the foundations of the church. We've explored some of the key ideas that make us a community following the will of God. The first was unity and how important it is to work together for the good of this world. Last week we looked at some of the specific actions we take as the community of God. And that included this idea of carrying the burdens of others. We don't ignore the challenges others face. We move toward them, offering whatever we can to help. There's no right or wrong way to do this either. There's absolute freedom in how we choose to do good for others. It's just that it has to actually be good for them. We heard how the Apostle Paul doesn't look kindly on those who are sneakily fulfilling their own selfish ambition. We've got to be humble and consider how God would judge our actions. We are directly responsible for how we care for others and how it is that we help carry their burdens. We were even encouraged to hold those in the church in special care. That's what it means to be a church. Now we transition to our last foundational topic on the church community. That is forgiveness. Uh, I'd like to reintroduce Lori, who's going to read for us the scripture for today. We are again looking at the Apostle Paul, this time from a different book he wrote called Ephesians. Paul was regularly trying to help these small churches navigate complicated waters of different religious and cultural practices. Last week we heard about some of the division in the church around Jewish and non-Jewish practices. This time Paul has in mind the occult, uh, people who were practicing magic, astrology, and believed in a destiny that was so strong that there was no escaping it. Here's what he has to say about how we are to treat one another, especially with these practices happening around and even in the community. This is Ephesians 4, chapter, uh, verse 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. Hear now the word of the Lord. So then, putting away falsehood, let, us, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so, there, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all the bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave us up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, may we be an inclusive community, passionately following Jesus Christ. Open our hearts to what forgiveness ought to look like in the church and with others out in the world. We don't want simple pat answers, Lord. We want the fullness of life in you. So guide us today. In Christ we pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but when someone tells me that I need to forgive, I nod my head and I say, yeah, yeah, I need to forgive. I know. I know I'm supposed to do that, but maybe I don't want to forgive. Maybe I'm not ready yet. I can look back at some of the toughest trials I've gone through, and still I'm hurt by some of those things. So I'm still not ready to forgive. People who would say they are committed followers of Jesus Christ have even hurt me and caused me pain. I think of one boss I had years ago and some of the things that I had to endure under him. Sometimes the bosses we work with can be the most challenging because we don't really have any other choices. They're antics we just have to put up with because our, our options are quit or get fired. And that doesn't leave you with many good choices, right? 
And if you don't have other things in order in your life, like money to get you through uh, finding your next job, an education in the right field, stability in your home life, or good health, you could find yourself truly stuck enduring an awful hardship. Well, I was stuck like that several years ago. I had a boss that accused me of doing things I didn't do, blamed me for things that I had no control over, and did things behind my back to mess up my career. If it's getting later into the evening and you ask me the right set of questions, you can still get me real riled up and tell you all about what happened in this period in my life. But the biggest problem I had with this person in my mind was the style of leadership that this person used. Years later, I heard the label for it as the zap gotcha method. He wouldn't tell you what your job was or what his expectations were. He'd let you do whatever you wanted. But as soon as you did something that he didn't like, zap, he'd get you for doing the wrong thing. And I was too young to understand what was happening at the time. But as I've gotten older, Uh, and manage people myself, I saw how preposterous this whole scenario was. It was at the tail end of working with this person after a final zap for no good reason that I vowed that I would never do that to somebody that I worked with, someone that I managed. I was going to be a better leader than that. So I started reading up on management If I'm going to be better than this person was, i got to know what I'm doing here. So I started reading up on how to work with other people. One of my favorite books is the story of a man who was an awful manager himself and eventually got fired for not leading well. With nothing to do, he ends up coaching a peewee hockey team. And he realizes that the problems he has at work are the same things plaguing his work with this peewee hockey team. He's got to learn a different way of doing things, and he sees how zapping people when they do something wrong doesn't make people better, it makes them worse. It makes people walk on eggshells, worried that they will upset the boss or violate some unwritten rule that they didn't know about. So he learns the right way to lead is to catch people doing things right. That's what encourages people. That's what builds them up and motivates them to work together and benefit the rest of the group. So I put this into practice. I'm catching people doing things right. I'm encouraging a better, healthier environment. And I feel good. I'm doing it right. I have created a better environment so that people are not emotionally scared and scarred from being at work. A few years removed from being so stuck, I feel on top of the world. And that's when I noticed that there was still something broken inside of me. That vow may have helped me to grow as a person, but it certainly didn't heal that hole in my heart from those injuries. It didn't reduce my bitterness. It didn't cure the anguish from that trauma. So what did I do wrong? How come I created a better path bringing good out of the bad that had happened to me, and I'm still upset. Why can't I get over that pain? And I know what I went through is just one of a long list of different kinds of pain and traumas that people go through. I've only been here at Grace for a little over a year now, but I have heard some of your painful experiences. Divorce, cancer, chronic pain, even fighting leading to factions. One of the toughest things I think many people have to deal with is not getting along with someone. And every time you are in the same room together, it's like daggers are coming at you. They don't even have to say anything. They just give you a look or turn, uh, turn around and walk away. And the trauma of the past is visiting you all over again. How do you heal when the past keeps hurting you in the present? In the Christian faith... This is a problem that we confront head on. We don't skirt around this issue or blame the victim. We say there is a better way to be in community. And the key here is forgiveness. 
the Apostle Paul, who was the founder of this church in the city of Ephesus, was writing to encourage them about what it looks like for this community to follow Jesus Christ. He starts by reminding them that this community was formed by the grace of God and that Jesus' death and resurrection means all of us have the opportunity to be adopted into the family of God. We can be made alive in Jesus Christ. Then he tells the church three things about what it means to be this Christian community. One, being united together, which we talked about two weeks ago. Two is that we live a new kind of life in Jesus, which we talked about last week in carrying each other's burdens. And three is that this new life comes with new rules. The new rule is build each other up. Be kind to each other. Be tender-hearted, and finally, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, Paul has some cachet with this community. They respect him a lot because when he was there with, with him, there was a, a pretty incredible incident that happened. It's actually found in another book of the Bible, the book of Acts, and it describes how Paul was preaching in the city and a guy named Demetrius was upset. He was angry that Paul was drawing people away from buying his silver shrines. Uh, there was a big temple of Artemis in this city, which was actually one of the seven wonders of the world. Some even said that of all the wonders, this one was the most spectacular. So Demetrius sells these silver shrines to remind people of their visit to this beautiful temple and to pray to Artemis. They are making a ton of money doing it, but since Paul showed up on the scene they started to lose some of their profits. They are so angry that they start a riot. They shout and scream and they want to kill Paul and his two friends with him because people keep converting and are rejecting idolatry which these silversmiths profit off of. Paul knows what it's like to be in a riot like this because he experienced one in a previous city to this one when he was stoned. That means they literally picked up the biggest rocks they could find, and they hurled them at Paul, the Apostle Paul. And uh, they did this until they thought he was dead. They dragged him out of the city to rot, but by the grace of God, he wasn't dead. And he stood back up, he went back into the city, and he kept preaching to them despite having the attempt of stoning him to death. It's a pretty incredible story, and it's nearly the same here in Ephesus. He's ready to dive right in there and persuade the people of the righteousness of Jesus, but people convince him otherwise. They love his boldness, though. They know Paul is more than willing to put his life at risk for the good of this Christian community. So when Paul says to forgive one another... They know he means it. He's serious here. He's saying, I've gone through some terrible things. In another place, it lists how he's been beaten and stoned and shipwrecked. He's drifting in the Mediterranean Sea for 24 hours. He's hungry and thirsty, stripped of his clothes. All of this just increases his resolve to tell others about God's incredible love and forgiveness. He has learned that God doesn't hold a grudge. God forgives the instant that you repent. That's one of the key ideas about forgiveness as you look at all the scriptures on the topic. Forgiveness happens when we confess and repent. Another key here is that forgiveness is not just for our sins in the past either. God knows we may presently have sin and that our future will include sin also. God forgives all of it. We call this eschatological forgiveness. If you didn't ask God for forgiveness in your last breath, right before death, God doesn't say, oh, you missed it, now you have to go to hell. No, that's not how this works. Forgiveness releases us from all the burdens, past, present, and future. I heard about an idea this week that I think applies well here. It's about how we think about our community. For some, people are like animals that need a fence to protect them. It creates a clear boundary of who is in and who is out. When you have a fence, you know exactly where you're supposed to be and not be, right? This is called a bounded set. 
But there's another way to keep animals together. Imagine you have a huge property, so big you can't keep all, all of it fenced in. What do you do? And the answer, of course, is that you build a well. It's the source of water that keeps the animals connected together. They don't need a fence when water is the source of life. When it comes to forgiveness, we could easily get stuck on what we see as the requirements to forgive another person. The boundaries, the fences of forgiven and unforgiven. They have to repent. They have to confess. They have to tell me they know they were wrong before I have to forgive them. Now that's true in a way especially if you are a brand new Christian and you are just figuring out the rules. But for many of us, what we really need to be focused on is digging wells. We need to be busy helping people access the source of life, the root of forgiveness. So how does this play out in our community? How can we dig wells in our day-to-day lives? Well, for me, it's a reminder that I've got to do more than just better manage people than my old boss did. That's a good start, making the world a better place. Do better than the people who came before you. But we've also got to be able to let go of these things from our past. We've got to forgive people even if they aren't ready. And and we need to work to imitate God in our relationships with one another. And how does God forgive? God forgives for all of time. God releases us from the burdens of the things we haven't even done yet. He sees past what is immediately in front of us. He sees the intention of our heart and the frailty of our human bodies, and he forgives. Paul points specifically to the love of Christ and how Christ died on a cross for us. And what does Jesus say from the cross? He says, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The only qualifier is the ignorance of those who sin. Jesus offers forgiveness to all, not just those who realize their mistakes, not just those who have already repented, for all. There is something cosmic going on here, where forgiveness is given before you even know that you need it. That's not to say confession doesn't matter or that repentance isn't integral to the Christian life. They do matter, and the fullness of the Christian community includes these things. But I wonder if what Paul is aiming at and what Jesus moves us toward is living with others as though they are already forgiven, anticipating that the moment they realize they are wrong, God forgives And we need to be ready to forgive, too. In fact, living by catching people doing things right will only increase people's confession and increase the realization that they need to to repent themselves. If we live in relation to others, knowing that God will forgive them, perhaps that will even help us to forgive, too. Releasing us from the wounds others inflict on us. Let's wrap up here. There are a number of things I could end with. I could tell you a story about how four young Jewish boys rescued a man out of the water who had a swastika tattooed on his hand. Or I could tell you about the shooting at an Amish schoolhouse and how at the funeral for the shooter, dozens and dozens of Amish folks surrounded the parents telling them that they loved the parents and that they forgave their son who had killed their children. I could tell you how if you pause at night and mentally forgive those who have hurt you, you'll sleep better at night. But let me end with this, the story of a man named Daylon who was put in jail for over a year after a fight at a bar. His crime? His sister called him to pick her up after a fight had broken out. He rushed over, and when he arrived, a man pointed a gun at him. He disarmed the man and threw the gun away, 
The police then began shooting at Daylon, so he ran, which totally makes sense in my mind. Uh, later, an officer testified that Daylon had pointed the gun at the officer and fired multiple times. Video evidence, however, showed that Daylon told the truth. He disarmed the man, tossed the gun, and ran when he was shot at. That's what landed him in jail for a whole year before he was finally released after a verdict of not guilty. That's what makes an incident a few years later all the more surprising. Delon had heard a boom and his house shook. At first he thought it was a small earthquake, but then a relative came to his door and told him that there was a car that had crashed outside of his apartment involving a police officer. He ran outside, saw the mangled car, and as it was engulfed in flames, he reached in and pulled the officer out of the vehicle. After losing a year of his life from false testimony, a year away from his children and his, uh, and his dear mother, he chose to forgive and risk himself to save another person. This is what he said. This is a quote. We need to work on our humanity. That's the main problem in this world. We're st stuck on how to get even, and that's not how I was raised. You learn you live, you move on, and I was always taught to forgive. You can't base every day of your life off of one interaction you have with an individual. I don't want to be called a hero. I just hope that trooper sees this and knows he's forgiven. Praise God. If we could be more like Daylon, what might this church and this world look like? Such willingness to let go and forgive someone, to not hold a grudge against a person or an institution that has wronged him, is an example for all of us. Delon reminds us what Jesus meant when he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. He isn't putting up a fence about what is right and what is wrong. He's digging a well so that the community can experience life. Let's be open to forgiving others, not only for the good it does for us, but for the good it does for the church and for the whole world. Amen? Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.